Good morning. It is good to be here again. I have a question for you. Are you familiar with the word prepper? Prepper. A couple of people familiar with the word prepper. What does it mean to be a prepper? I don't ask rhetorical questions, so I like to hear answers. What does it mean to be a prepper? That's what morticians do. Okay. In Jonathan's line of work, I can see how he goes there. All right. It's not exactly what I was thinking of. But we, we hear a lot about preppers today, at least I do anyway. And Kara, I, I know Kara knows what a prepper is. Kara, what's a prepper? Okay, people who prepare for disaster. Prepare for disaster. And it's a fairly, I don't know how, how modern the word is, you know, and using for preparing, preparing for disaster. Um, but it's not a modern idea. Back in the, what, 60s and 70s, when everybody's worried about nuclear warfare and nuclear strikes and everything, they were building these underground bunkers and bomb shelters where they'd have, you know, a couple years supply of food, you know, in these underground shelters and stuff like that. Not a new concept. That's considered being a prepper. A prepper. Today, we have people who are preppers, who are preparing for uncertain times, whatever that may be. Preparing for disaster, preparing for a social collapse, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, preparing, you know, being a prepper. And, you know, I, I have some, some friends who are preppers, you know. There's lots and lots and lots of food stocked up and stored up, and you have loads of guns, loads of ammunition, okay? And we think, oh, we're exempt from that. I, I, I really wonder, if I asked for a raise of hands, how many people are preppers? <laughs> I wonder. Hmm. We are not exempt. Is it a bad thing to be a prepper? Nobody's shaking their head, nodding their head. Okay. Is it a good thing to be a prepper? Okay. I got a couple of yeses. All right. <laughs> Depends on what you're prepping for. Okay. It also depends on what your motivation is, I believe, in prepping, being a prepper. So today, the title of the sermon is Being a Godly Prepper. Being a Godly Prepper. We have always had, you know, as mankind anyway, we've always had this fascination with, with knowing the future, knowing what's coming. And actually, it, it is a big, big, big business these fortune tellers, horoscopes, different things like that, your, uh, your zodiac signs and all this stuff. It's all about knowing the future. And guess what? That is witchcraft that has serious consequences that needs to be repented of. Okay? It's sin. Okay? Don't, don't, don't even go there. But it's big business. Big business. I read a statistic that it was like 70% of the population in the United States on a regular basis reads their horoscope. 70%. That's a lot. And out of that 70%, There's 7%, now it seems like a very small percentage of that, there's 7% of that 70% who, who literally read that horoscope and change their behavior because of that horoscope. So they believe what that horoscope says and they change their behavior because of it because they're afraid of whatever might happen. 
Okay, and you think, oh, it's only 7%. Well, it's like 12 million people on a daily basis changing their behavior because of witchcraft. Hmm. There's a lot. That's a lot. And we, we look at different things and, and we, what we want to know, is this, is this right or is this wrong? Should I do this or shouldn't I do this? Because if I don't do this, then what? If, and your brain starts to run away with itself. And we're like, okay, now if there is some sort of a problem, maybe I should have you know, something stored up for this. Or... Hmm. We have been, giving, have been given the ultimate prepper device as believers. You know what the ultimate prepper device is? This kind of sounds sacrilegious calling the Holy Spirit a device, but the Holy Spirit in our lives is the ultimate prepper device. Ultimate. Because the Holy Spirit of the living God says, you know what? How about you pick that up? You might need that for later. My wife just came home the other day with something. She's like, ah, I don't know why. God told me to buy it. Okay. <laughs> so it sits down in our storage room, you know, until... Sometime when somebody pops in unexpectedly and we're like, oh, I know why. <laughs> and that has happened several times in, in our lives. The Holy Spirit of the living God living in each one of us will guide us and direct us to preparing. If we are preparing and being a prepper based on fear or anxiety, it is not of God. Not of God in the least little bit. And you're like, well, how do I know if I'm preparing out of fear or anxiety? Well, what would happen if all of your preparations that you have made were suddenly gone? How would you feel about that? You know, we've oftentimes joked around as, as uh, children of the Grabers. How's that? Um, if there was some sort of a, a need going on, guess where we would end up? At the Grabers' house because mom has a lot of food. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I don't think mom's preparing that out of fear by any means. It's just, it's there. She's very willing to share it with people. You know? But how would you feel if it was gone? You walk downstairs and it was just gone. Would you feel all of a sudden fearful? All of a sudden, oh no, what if? I have to get all that back. And you stress yourself out a bit about getting it back. Hmm. I don't think that's God's heart by any stretch of the imagination. What is the influence and what is the purpose for preparing? Ultimately, for most people, it's self-preservation, self-protection. And we look at it and we say, well, there's nothing really wrong with trying to protect myself. Hmm. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> because our job is to say yes to God. Our job is is to say, God, you are my protector. You are my provider. Now, the scripture gives us several different instances of uh, preppers. Several different instances all over the place. And we can, you know, we can make the word of God say whatever we want. We really can. We can say, okay, God says, you know, take no thought for tomorrow. You know, the, the birds, they don't store anything at all. Be like the birds. And so, you know, we're going to, Literally, take no thought for tomorrow. And we're going to spend our paycheck today and, and it, we're not going to have anything stored up at all and so because God says we're not supposed to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to worry about itself. We can make the word of God say that and it does. It says that. Or we could, you know, go, go to the ant, you sluggard. If you don't work, you don't eat. Oh, whoa. So it's all about me working. It's the only way I'm going to eat is if I provide it for myself. And we oftentimes say there's a balance, right? There's a balance. 
And if we're worked up and worried that we can't do this and we have to provide for ourselves and we're all anxious about it, that's not good, one side of the ditch. Or if we're saying, you know what? Whatever happens, happens. Whatever happens, happens. I don't think that's God's heart either. It was mentioned earlier, you know, that the times that we live in right now, 2020, it, it's a very stressful time. I have seen people's true colors come out this year more than any other year I think I've ever seen. There's been a lot of fear, a lot of fear going around, a lot of division going around. Fear, division, are those from the kingdom of heaven, from, from God's kingdom? No. So we know that those are from the enemy, from Satan, but those same factors, fear and division, are coming into our own circles, our own churches. And it's sad. It's sad. And so are we preparing for the future by using a tool of Satan? Fear. You, you, you've heard me say it before. You cannot use a tool of Satan to bring about righteousness. You cannot do it. Okay. Hey, for instance, <clears throat> you know, Little Johnny, he's going he's gonna to go down to the river, okay, and he's going to go fishing for the day. And so you tell little Johnny, little Johnny, be very careful because you don't want to fall in the river because if you fall in the river, it's really cold out and you might freeze to death out there today. Whoa, poor little Johnny doesn't even want to go fishing now. You are trying to instill fear to try to bring about something good, safety. Don't use fear to bring about something safety. Bring about safety. So instead of saying, little Johnny, don't go down the river and please don't, don't, don't make, make sure you don't fall in. Because if you fall in, you're going to freeze to death. Be like, hey, Johnny, here. <laughs> make sure you stay within my sight so that I can see what's going on. Because I want you to come back because I love you a lot. I love you a lot. Okay? You're bringing about you know, protection and safety through love, a tool of the Lord. And I, I see, I, I'm, I'm on the, the Burkholder farm there quite a bit. And so on the Burkholder farm, there is a, uh, a device right now that flies around the farm a lot. It's called a go-kart. It is forever flying around the farm. <laughs> and this thing is, is zooming all over the place, you know, around this farm. And sometimes I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> and it, 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 it works me up sometimes I have to admit that it does <laughs> um, what am I going to do am I going to go to the people who are zooming around saying oh no you need to keep this down under 10 mile an hour because if you keep if you over 10 mile an hour you, you might roll this thing and, and you're going to break your arm using a tool of Satan fear but I feel like that's a lot of what has happened in 2020 a lot of what has happened in 2020 it was you can't do this and you can't do this and you can't do this because what if? Instead of saying, God, you are in charge. You are in control. What do you want me to do? And we look at the scripture and we say, God, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to continue fellowshipping in person? I know that's a big hot topic. And I appreciate and I love the fact that we can do this. We can fellowship in person. Because God is our protector. Now we're not going to do stupid things if we're sick. Stay home. I get that. <laughs> but God is our protector. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And if you are any kind of a Bible scholar, you know that Daniel chapter 2 is a big Bible prophecy chapter. 
And I am not going to get into the Bible prophecy part of Daniel chapter 2. Primarily because I don't understand it. <laughs> There's a lot going on in the last part of this chapter that I look at and I say, whoo, <laughs> I don't know, God. If you want me to do something about this, you show me. Other than that, I'm not going to worry about it because <laughs> it just gets, it gets to be a bit much. But there was something that was happening here in Daniel chapter 2 that is quite phenomenal, quite phenomenal. God was speaking. Somebody said, whoa, this is important. Somebody else said, you're right, it is important, let me go ask God what it means. And I'm concerned about today Because we look around in our world around us and we say, whoa, something's important. I better pay attention. I better find out what's so important. So we turn on the radio and we listen to Glenn Beck, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, Rush Limbaugh. And it concerns me a lot. Because if we're going to sources like that for answers from God, it's not going to happen. And if we're going to media, talk radio, for answers from God, you're not going to find them there. You know what you're going to find? Fear. A lot of division. And it's sad. It's sad. See, I work on cars for a living. And, and I, I love working on cars. And I love how I can tell a little bit about a person by their car. You know, uh, um, Larry Burkett always used to say, show me a man's checkbook and I'll show you who the man is. Okay? <laughs> you know, show, show, show me what he spends his money on. I'll show you who he is. Well, <clears throat> show me a person's car. I'll tell you a lot about the person. <laughs> show me a person's car what radio station is on I'll tell you a lot about the person I'm dead serious and maybe I'm nosy but occasionally I do go through the presets oh <laughs> if we're on a long test drive in the car or something like that I go anyway there's my secrets out okay <laughs> uh, but I like to know I like to know you know what, what is going on you know in you know, in people's minds. And then, you know, I, I go through their presets and I, and, I, and I listen to, oh, wow, this guy listens to a lot of AM radio. Oh, my. <laughs> and Ben and I joke around all the time. We're like, that's for old people. <laughs> AM. Who listens to AM? <laughs> there are still a lot of people who listen to AM talk radio. And I'm like, whoo, my mind is blown. <laughs> but, but we have a lot of that going on that we're, we're listening to people that we agree with that are not necessarily being led by the Spirit of the living God. And it's causing division. And it concerns me. And then out of that, our prepping gets tainted. Our prepping goes from I am going to make sure that I'm listening to God. And God says, by this, how can I help somebody else with it later on? To, whoa, I need to protect myself. This whole thing is going down. And I'm going to have a bag packed and a bag ready for when everything blows up, I'm in the woods somewhere. There's a lot of people like that. What are you going to do? Just leave your whole family? Leave the people you love? Head out into the woods and survive by yourself? That's a pretty self-centered, selfish thing to do. Hmm. Or are you going to be like, God, show me how I'm supposed to be prepared so that I can help others, so I can be a blessing to my next door neighbor that I can't take. Hmm. All right, here we go. Daniel chapter 2. 
And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. Nebuchadnezzar, godly man or ungodly man? Which one? Ungodly. ungodly. Okay. The dream that he had, was it from God or from Satan? I found it fascinating that God gives dreams to ungodly men. Actually, we see it several times in Scripture where God would give dreams to ungodly men and the ungodly men would be like, what do I do with this dream? And then they had to find a godly man to interpret the dream. Joseph, Daniel, we see that and we're like, wow, okay, God, that's how you're talking. Through dreams to ungodly men. Love it. Fascinating concept. And then we see in Scripture that in the last days, the young men will see visions and the old men will dream dreams. And, and I look at that and I wonder, is that because nobody can listen to the Holy Spirit? That God has to speak in dreams? And I don't have a good answer for that because I have had dreams where I believe they're from God. So I say, hmm, <laughs> am I not able to hear your spirit, God? But there are plenty of times where I'm like, oh, God tells me to do it, I'll do it. God still speaks through dreams. Not all dreams are from God. <laughs> Listen, a lot of dreams are from pizza or whatever you're thinking about before you go to bed, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> if you have a dream from the Lord, you'll know it. You wake up like, whoa, you'll know it. That's, <laughs> if you don't know it, go back to bed. Okay. <laughs> All right. So anyway, Nebuchadnezzar, dream dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. The king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spoke the Chaldeans to the king of Syria, or the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. I think that's a pretty good idea. Okay, so the, here's, the, here's the idea. The king says, I've had a dream. I want to call all my wise men in, and they're going to tell me the interpretation of the dream. So in which the wise men say, fine, perfectly fine. Tell us what you dreamed, and we'll tell you the interpretation. Sounds legit. Logical. Normal. Right? So far up to this point. Okay. Verse 5. Then the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. I don't remember what I dreamed about. Uh-oh. We've got a problem. He wants us to show the interpretation of the dream, and he doesn't remember what he dreamed about. <laughs> if ye will not make known to me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you will be cut in pieces, and I'll use your houses as outhouses. That's what he says. <laughs> that's, that's pretty strong language. Guess what, guys? You're all here. Show me the interpretation of the dream. Okay, tell us the dream. We'll tell you the interpretation of it. Yeah, I don't remember the dream. You're going to tell me the dream and the interpretation. If you don't, you're done. That's not fair. That's not. <laughs> That's not fair. That's not right. We would call that not logical thinking by any stretch of the imagination. What in the world is going on? Hmm. These men who were so wise were like, no, we, we can't. It's not possible. It is not possible. It says, in verse 6, but if you show me the dream and the interpretation thereof, Ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. And they answered and said again, or they answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and then we will show the interpretation thereof. 
And the king answered and said, I know of a certainty that ye would gain the time. So he said, you're trying to buy time. You're just telling me this again. You're trying to buy some time to try to figure out how to get your necks not from being chopped off, okay? You're trying to gain some, some time here. That's what he's saying. Because ye see the thing is gone from me. So you're afraid of it that it's gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For she, ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. So he's saying, you can tell me whatever you want for an interpretation of the dream if I would remember the dream and tell you the dream. Because how am I supposed to know what the interpretation is? So you can prepare all these lying and corrupt words for me, and I'm not going to know. So I think it's a pretty good idea that if you remember the dream that I dreamed, that you did not dream, then I'll know you're probably going to be pretty accurate with the interpretation. <laughs> How easy is it to remember your dreams? Well, I guess some dreams are fairly easy, but for the most part, your dreams when you wake up in the morning, do you remember them? Most of the time, no. And the king didn't remember them. How easy would it be for David to remember my dream that I didn't tell him about? How easy would that be? Not, not possible. It's not a possible thing. But that's what's going on. Verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man on earth that can show the king's matter. There is no king, no lord, nor ruler that asks us such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it's a rare thing that the king requireth. And there is nobody, nobody that can show you what your dream was. Nobody that dwells among flesh. That's what it says. Nobody with flesh. And they were right on that. Nobody with flesh, no human being can actually do this and there's no human being, king or lord or ruler that has ever asked what you are asking for us to do. They hit him pretty hard. Did it deter the king? Did it change his mind? No. The king says, off with your heads. Pretty much. It is a rare thing, and there's not any flesh. Verse 12, For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men in Babylon. If the decree, and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. They were considered wise men. Different story, different time. Verse 14, then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch, so he's basically saying, what's the rush to kill me? What's the hurry? Why, why do you want to kill us so quickly? I mean, eventually, maybe, yeah, I understand that, but what's the hurry? <laughs> yeah, that's what he's saying. Why, why is it so hasty from the king? And then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and desired of the king. That's a brave thing to do. The king just says, kill them all. Kill all the wise men. Daniel says, I need to go talk to the king. Whoa. He wasn't exactly preparing for the future here. He was preparing to die. 
Here we have a very angry king who just said, off with all their heads, including Daniel. I'll go talk to him. <laughs> that was not exactly a selfish thing to do. A lot of what's going on in preppers is very self-centered. Very self-centered. And if we're prepping in a self-centered way, then we know it's not from God. If we are prepping because of our love for others and desire to help others, I don't think there's anything wrong with being prepared. I do not think there's anything wrong with being prepared. Now, if you're gonna, you can go overboard with the whole thing and have like three years supply of food sitting around, well, you're gonna always be eating rotten food. You know, that's whew, not gonna last that long. <laughs> it's not gonna work. You got, three years worth of meat in your freezer, what do you start with? You might as well start with the fresh stuff because by the time you get to the fresh stuff, that'll be freezer burnt. Okay? <laughs> so, anyway. My wife knows freezer burnt food is one of my pet peeves. Let's, let's keep enough in there where we can eat it <laughs> and enjoy it while we eat it. All right, but anyway, so Daniel, he goes in and he says, I need to talk to the king. Daniel went in, desired to the king that he would give him time. So he just flat out says, it. hey, I need a little bit of time, king. King, I'll get, I'll, if I can have a little more time. And I'll show you your interpretation. He didn't say, give me a little bit of time. I hope you can show me the dream by then so that I can show you the interpretation. He goes right to the interpretation. Give me a little time. I have no idea what this dream is. But I'll show you your interpretation. Verse 17, Then Daniel went to his house, and he made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his three friends, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. I think there's a difference between a dream and a night vision. I'm not going to get into all the differences between a dream and a night vision. But there's a difference. Just know that there's a, a difference. Remember, this is a man of God that went to seek advice from God. And God says, yeah, I'll give you advice. There it is. There it is. Hmm. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge unto them that know understanding. He revealed the deep secret, or the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth in him. I thank thee and praise thee, O Lord, or O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what, was, what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. So he is saying, I'm going to go find out what this is. Whoa! I now know what this is because I'm a pretty wise guy. Right? Nah. No. He actually did exactly the opposite. He goes, it's not about me. It has nothing to do with me but it has everything to do with the person who put Nebuchadnezzar in authority. And that same God who put Nebuchadnezzar in authority now revealed to me the dream and what his interpretation is. So he gives all the credit back to God. In verse 24, Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king hath ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon, Still not, af not afraid, not afraid. And he went and said unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Now, just in case you are thinking, 
that it would not be hard at all, not be difficult at all to be like, okay, the king doesn't remember his dream, so I'm going to make up a dream for him. Okay? That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Because I have already had dreams, and, and I'm thinking about them later on, you know, whatever, little bits and pieces of it. And then you start talking about the dream. I tell my wife, you know, oh, I dreamed this strange thing, and whatever it is. And, and the more I talk about it, the more it comes back to remembrance. And if she asked me a question about the dream, no. No, that didn't happen. Well, huh? you automatically know it. And so the king, once Daniel started talking, the king started remembering. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's what the dream was about. Hmm. Verse 27. Uh, no, before that. Uh, verse 25. Then Arioch brought Daniel in before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. And the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and maketh known to the king Belteshazzar what shall be in the latter days. So he's saying, you know what? All your wise men can't reveal this, but there's a God who can. He is pointing to God, pointing a ungodly king to God. And then he goes into the entire dream. And we're not going to get into the whole dream. The dream was about, you know, there's a golden head, you know, and we had the, 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 the what, what a big old statue with the golden head and then the silver and then the bronze and then the, the iron and the, the clay and the, um, the clay and iron feet and then there was toes on those feet and, you know, everything and the big stone was dropped on them and crushed them. And it, there, there's a lot of symbolism in there that... I look at and it overwhelms me. <laughs> and I'm like, God, I'm glad you got this in control because I don't. I don't know what that looks like. But I do know that even because of this dream, people started preparing. And because of this dream, we know that there's a time coming well, that we're going to be prepared for. David Wilkerson gave a message back in the late 1900s, 1998, 99, somewhere in there. And uh, he was preparing his congregation for hard times. He said, you know what, there's going to be hard times coming. And he said, I believe there's going to be a time where we're going to see rioting and looting like we've never seen before and we're going to see you know store shelves being emptied he said i, I believe we're going to see a time we're going to see and I, i'm looking at I, I cannot believe what is going on in our country now we're seeing store shelves being emptied by people that are panicking in fear and they're buying it all and then we're seeing store shelves being emptied by upset and angry and divided people and I look at it and I say something's coming God I don't know what it is and I'm okay with not knowing what it is but I want to listen to you on how to prepare I don't want to listen to media. I don't want to listen to famous people on TV or YouTube on how to prepare. I want to listen to God. And if God tells me that you prepare by moving to India, I'll do it. 
And if God tells me you prepare by staying right where you're at, I'll do it. But I am not going to allow fear to tell me how to prepare. And I'm not going to allow division to tell me how to prepare. And we have a lot of that going on right now, and I wonder how much of our preparing for the future, or whatever, is being based on fear and division. And then the flip side of that, we can just ignore the whole thing and move on. Say, that's the other end of the spectrum, other, other ditch on the other side of the road. Ignore the whole thing, nothing's happening, nothing's going on. Whatever happens, happens. And then God says later on, hey, you need to help this person out. We say, I can't help this person out. Well, I told you to prepare. Hmm. And we didn't listen. See, there are plenty of times in Scripture where God gives um, preparing messages. Like with Pharaoh and Joseph, you know, he tells them about the whole drought coming and everything, and he, the whole time he had to prepare. He, he gave that, that dream so that they could prepare, so that the children of Israel could be spared. Remember that? That's amazing. Lots of preparation. And there was another time where God says, hey, guess what? The only thing you need to do to prepare is put the blood on the doorpost and then grab what's in reach and start walking. That's not much pre preparation going on. And God takes this whole entire crowd of people out in the middle of the wilderness and says, this is amazing. They're not prepared at all. Now I can provide. <laughs> I love it. The Holy Spirit, the living God, lives inside of each one of us. And we've talked about the Holy Spirit, the living God, being the umpire of our soul. And we have that check in our spirit saying, hmm, not right, or go ahead and do that. Make sure we know how to listen to the Holy Spirit of the living God. And when the Holy Spirit of the living God prompts us to prepare and to do something, we do it. And there's complete peace in the preparation. If we lose our peace, stop. Stop. Because if there is any point in time where you become afraid and fearful of what you're doing and what's coming on, it's not from God. It's not from God. Stop. And listen. One of the best ways of stopping and listening is fasting. And that's, I'd like to talk about that someday, but <clears throat> not today. But fasting is, the, the, the purpose of fasting is to align our heart with God's heart. That's the purpose of fasting. To align our heart with God's heart. And say, God, what do you want me to do? And we, we deny our physical body, our flesh, which is all messed up, okay? We deny that flesh something that it wants, and that's food, so that we can listen to God. And it aligns our heart with God's heart. And so if we ever come to that point, we're like, we don't know what to do. Skip a couple meals. As far as I know, there's not a person in this room that wouldn't benefit from it. <laughs> Both physically and spiritually. So my challenge today is to be a godly prepper. We have all we need in the Holy Spirit. We have been blessed beyond anything that we can imagine here in the United States of America completely spoiled rotten and blessed. Don't take advantage of that. Don't ignore the leading of the Holy Spirit. And don't be so self-centered where we're going to be like, I'm going to do my own thing and ignore the rest of the world. Because if we do, there's no answers, no answers for the rest of the world. 
Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are the God of the impossible, and Lord, I thank you that you have answers even when we don't. Lord, I thank you that you can reveal stuff to us, and Lord, I just pray that you would speak to each one of us, and Lord, I pray that you would show us how we are to prepare for the future and not use fear to do it, not use the wisdom of man, the other voices that are going on all around us in the media. But Lord, I just pray that you would speak to us and we would know your voice and we would listen to your voice and follow your voice. Lord, we want to be used of you no matter what. We want to spread the gospel. We do not want to spread fear. Thank you for what you are doing in and through us. We look forward to seeing what you are going to do because you hold the future. In Jesus' name, amen.